So um, today we're going to talk about uh, yeah, the Hebrew idea of community uh, and how that impacts our thinking, especially coming out of the West. Uh, Western culture has a very different idea of community than the Hebraic idea. And of course, as you know, the Bible is written from a Jewish Hebraic perspective. So when we read the Bible, we're reading about a culture that has a very different view than we do. And if we don't read the culture, or if we don't read the text according to its culture, we won't understand what the text is actually saying. We'll read the text according to our culture and change the meanings of the words without actually knowing that we're doing that, so they fit what we believe. And so what I try to do is to help people understand what's happening in the culture of the scripture so that you can then evaluate whether or not your behavior is in alignment with the kingdom of God, which is what the scripture is about. Okay? Fair enough? Um, and if you have any questions or whatever, just let's just stop and dialogue. You know, this is a church and not much. We're just trying to understand. So if there's something that I say that you don't understand, just stop me and we'll talk. Okay? So we're going to look at me, you, us, the Hebrew idea of community. And the Hebrew idea of community begins with understanding who I am. Right? Um, this is especially important in Hebrew because if I don't know who I am, I can't know where I'm going. I have to see how I fit into the community in order to know how I interact with the community. And that, I think, helps us understand this enormous difference between the Hebrew idea of community and the Greek idea of community because the notion of individual in Greek thinking is very different than the notion of individual in Hebrew thinking. Okay? Um, in the Greek mindset, the emphasis of Greek thinking is on me as the center of the universe. And I don't mean that selfishly. I mean that in Greek thinking, um, you remember the phrase, man is the measure of all things. In Greek thinking, I'm the one who determines the, the perspective of my world and my interaction in the world. And so in Greek thinking, the individual is the primary target of all the scripture and all the interaction that a person has with the world and with other people. Right? Um, you can see that, actually you can see that very clearly in the, in the secular approach to psychology. Because the secular approach to psychology is based on this Greek worldview. And for example, when you go to see a therapist, the therapist is working on your individual behaviors or your individual understanding in order to shape your decisions to make your world better. Right? But it's definitely focused on you. Uh, it's your issues, your emotions, your experiences, and how I'm going to assist you in making decisions that will improve your life. Um, that, that isn't a Hebraic idea at all, because the Hebraic idea of who I am is tied directly to the people that I participate with. Um, so in Greek thought, because it's all about the individual, uh, it, the effectiveness of my relationship with God is really about what it means to me. Right? If, and so, and what, I call, we have what I call benefits evangelism in, in Christian thinking, and that is I serve God because of something he does for me. Uh, either he gets me into heaven, or he improves my life, or he changes my relationship, or he, gives, or he finds a wife for me, or whatever. But whatever it is, God is my God because he does things for me. Um, whereas the Hebraic idea is quite different. I serve God because he's king of the universe. And whatever he's doing, I'm participating in. And it has, sometimes doesn't have very little of, to do with me, but he's invited me to participate in his plans. So, in order for me to understand how that individualism changes the shape of my community, I need to know what the culture tells me about what it means to be an individual. And here's some ideas about what the culture says. The culture says that if I'm going to be an individual, I need to stand up for myself. Right? I need to make decisions that affirm me in opposition to others. So, if I'm feeling like your, your actions or your behavior or your words about me aren't aren't uh, honorable or they aren't, um, uh, what's the right word? They aren't uh, acceptable to me, then the culture teaches me that I should stand up and, and confront you about it. Right? I should say, hey, you can't act like that toward me, or you can't say those things toward me. In other words, I should be aggressive about my own individual stance. Culture also teaches me, of course, that I have to protect myself. Right? So. Um, there's a big argument in the United States going on politically now about guns. And uh, the idea behind uh, gun control is, of course, the advocates of, of being able to carry guns. It's an issue of protection. I need to protect myself in an environment where it's dangerous. It's dangerous for me to go to some places 
and so then I need to make sure that I'm adequately protected. Um, and that idea stems from the Greek thinking that my, I'm responsible for my individual well-being, I'm responsible for my safety, and I'm responsible for the world that I live in, and so it comes down to my decisions. Right? The other, you might think about the way that um, certain um, Christian ideas are associated with prosperity. So that the whole point there is that I remember seeing a sign on the side of a bus in Los Angeles, and it said, um, God loves you and wants to make you wealthy. Come to our church at such and such, and you know, I mean, who wouldn't want to be wealthy? Right? Especially if God's going to make me wealthy. So the idea there is it's still about me, isn't it? It's about what's going to happen to me and how much money I'm going to have in my bank. And if God's really good to me and I really, and I tithe a lot and I make sure that I say my prayers and read my Bible, then he's automatically going to fill my bank account every month. Right? I mean, that idea there is it's still focused on who I am. But in our culture, it's, it's part of the way that we think. And even if we don't have God in the culture, we still think just like the Beatles. I, me, me, mine. Remember that song? Hey, you're probably too young. <laughs> <laughs> George Harrison, I, me, me, mine. It's all about me, right? Um, and it, I don't know the Australian culture well enough to know that, that how you would respond to those ideas, but I suspect, because the Western and Greek ideas are also part of the Australian culture, that there is this feeling that I must stand up for myself, I must protect myself, I deserve to be taken care of, I have the right to, you know, I have the right to wealth and prosperity. Um, and the worst case, of course, is that uh, the government will take care of me if I don't. Right? So the, all that is focused around the cultural idea that individualism is supreme. Um, and we, and by the way, just in case you thought that that doesn't affect you because you're, you know, because you're Hebraic in your worldviews, then I would challenge you to ask yourself whether you've ever asked your children what do you want to do when you grow up, because the idea that I can ask my child what he wants to do is still based in individual uh, emphasis, right? It's, uh, your children come with a blank slate, and it's up to them to decide what they want. Right? In a Hebraic worldview, you would ask a very different question. You wouldn't ask your child, what do you want to be, which, which in, implies that they have a choice to do anything that they want, and whatever choice they make is the right one. In a Hebraic worldview, you would ask the question, what does God have in mind for you? What plans does God have for you? What purposes do you have in your life that will fulfill God's purposes in the cosmic universe, right? And that means that there aren't an unlimited number of choices for me as a person, that I must first discover what God has in mind, and I will be fulfilled as a person as I choose those. So it's not a matter of if you want to be a dentist or a doctor or an astronaut. It's a question of what does God want from me? What does, and Abraham Heschel actually says that the most important question a man can ever ask, and a, and a woman too, by the way, the most important question that a woman can ever ask is, what does God demand of me? Right? Because if he really is king of the universe, if he really is the sovereign God of all creation, then the only question that I need to ask for myself is, what does he want from me? Right? It's, not, it's not what can I get from him, but what does he want from me? Right? Completely upside down from our idea that somehow God's supposed to be taking care of me. Okay? So once we understand the differences in these cultures, then the Hebrew scriptures start to make some sense. Because now we have the two great commandments. And the two great commandments look like they could be focused on the individual. If we read them from that perspective, right? What's the first one? Love. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength in the Greek. But of course, Yeshua wasn't speaking Greek. He was speaking Hebrew, right? So since he was speaking Hebrew, where does that commandment come from? Did he make it up? No, it's from the Old Testament. No, where does it come from? The Old Testament, the Torah. It comes from the Torah. In fact, it's a part of Deuteronomy chapter yeah. 6. Yeah. Right? And this is what's really interesting in that story. The scribe, remember the story? The scribe comes to him and he says, Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua, what is the greatest commandment? Remember that? It's, so the scribe asks a question that he already has the answer for. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of him being actually interested in Yeshua's approach to what the commandments are. He's checking to make sure that Yeshua meets his requirements for a proper rabbi by giving him the proper answer. Right? And what answer does he give? He gives the answer of the Shema, which every Jew that was in the first century would have said three times a day. So the answer that he gets back is an answer that he's already familiar with. It's not news to him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength. And in Hebrew it says whatness, all your whatness. Right? 
So, what's your wetness? Yeah, you know, shake me out. I don't know what wetness is. It, okay, it's like the word manna. You know what the word manna means? Hmm. What is it? That's what it means. Hmm. <laughs> so, because they didn't know what it was, manna, do you know what manna is? If you're walking, uh, don't do this, because I understand you have snakes here. But if you were walking out in the bush and you came across this sort of jelly-like bread moldy stuff that's <laughs> laying there on the ground white, you would say, what is this? And the answer is manna, because the word manna means, what is this, right? Okay, so now here comes the commandment. And the commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart. What's the Hebrew word? Left. Um, right? What, so, does that mean that I have Jesus in my heart? And then that, that's sufficient? What does the Hebrew word lev actually mean? Right? The Hebrew word lev is a, is a is a circumlocution for not falling off of a chair. <laughs> this Hebrew word lev is a circumlocution. That means it's a it's like a synonym for every for my emotions, my act, my volition, and my rational thinking. Right? The word heart is used as a summary of all of those things. So when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, it doesn't mean that you have a feeling toward God. Right? I just have a good feeling toward you, Lord. Oh, I'm so thankful. That's not what it's about. What it's about is that I commit my will, my emotions, and my thought to you. Right? Remember when Dev, uh, David says, give me a clean, give me clean hands and a pure heart. He's not talking about um, having surgical bypass. He's, ha he's talking about having a heart that's completely committed to God, right? So, love what you got with all your heart means that you turn over your will, your emotions, and your mind, rational thinking, right? Okay? So, let's think about that. Let's suppose that we actually took that command seriously, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That means that God is in control uh, because you've given it to him. He's, he is, you've given him your emotional life. That's interesting. We can certainly understand that we can give him our rational life. After all, we just have to think like God. And we can give him our volitional life. I'll choose the things that you choose, God. But the heart means also my emotions. So how do you give God your emotions? Don't you still have feelings? Right? It's not like I give God my emotions and now my life is passively calm all the time. No. Think about the Psalms. What happens with David? Does David express emotions in the Psalms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one day he's saying, God, I'm so angry at these people who are trying to give me a bad time. Why don't you just wipe them off the face of the earth? Right? Get up, God. Right? Take, exterminate them and their babies, by the way. Get rid of the whole thing. Remember that? They're called the imprecatory psalms. It's anger psalms, okay? What else does, what other emotions does David have? Joy. Hmm? Joy. Yeah, so think about it. David at one point or another is, is telling you, is telling God, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so humiliated. I'm so ashamed of what I've done. I feel so low. At another point he's saying, oh, I can't wait to go into the house of the Lord. It's so wonderful to praise him. He's feeling so high, low, high, anger, sorrow, right? Uh, repentance, remission, all kinds of, everything's going on in the Psalms. That's why we love the Psalms. You know, we love the Psalms because they're emotional. Okay? I mean, it's you don't get the same emotion over reading about how you're supposed to take care of the neighbor's field when, you, when your fire is accidentally burned into his crops, right? I don't see people weeping with sorrow and, and being angry about those kinds of things. But when it comes to the Psalms, it's emotions all over the place. So, so here's the question. How does, then, how does David turn over his emotions to God? How does he do that? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, first, he says to God how he feels. You know, look, God, I've, all night long I've been crying on my pillow, and I don't hear anything from you. What's the matter? Right? Is, do you pray like that? Do you pray, Lord, how come you don't answer me? I've been after you and after me after I need the answer to this, and I don't hear from you. It's, I'm not going to put up with this anymore, Lord. Is that how you pray? Right. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Or you march around outside shaking your fist at God because he's not being God in your life. Yep. He's not doing what you want. Yep. Okay? So, is that giving my emotion to God? Yes. Well, for some people, they'd say, oh, no, you can't treat God like that. You can't say those things. I mean, that's, that's, 
blasphemous, that's insulting to God. But David is like, come on, God. Okay? And the very next moment, David's on his face on the ground saying, oh, I'm so sorry. You're, you're, you're holy. I'm not. I, mean, I, I just give over everything to you, Lord. Just do with me as you wish. Right? So you see how you give your emotions to God is you first let God in to your feelings. Okay? What else do you have to do in order to give your emotions to God? You have to tell God how you feel. I mean, does, does God not know how you feel? Of course he does. So why would he want you to tell him? Because you need to say it to him. That's why. Right? You need to tell him, this is how I feel, Lord. Okay? So when I do that, what's the next step that I have to do? Try to align my emotions to his. Yeah, that's really difficult, though. Emotions are hard things to align. In fact, the Greeks feared emotions because they carry you someplace you didn't want to go. Right? It, it, and the idea of an emotion is that it's a passion. The word is tasco. And it means that it comes over you. It's not, you're not in control of it. Right? You're not in control of walking along the street in uh, Mumbai and seeing someone, a crippled person, begging on the street to stay alive. And all of a sudden, you're overcome with compassion. You start crying. Wait, do you have to get that under control? Oh, I shouldn't have those tears. No, the emotion sweeps you into a feeling. Right? So you are swept into the feeling, and then you say, Lord, what can I do? Right? So now I've expressed my emotion to God. What's the next thing that I have to do? Surrender. Surrender that emotion to Him. Right. The next thing I have to do is say, you know how I feel, Lord. Now I'm content with whatever you bring into my life. I surrender it to you. So here's how I feel. I want you to be really clear about how I feel. And now I give that over to you so that you do whatever you want with it. Right? And the third thing is, I have to follow up on the action that comes as a result of that. Right? It's no good for me to just be an emotional vent. I have to actually do something with the emotion after I've given it over to God. And my suggestion is, to love the Lord your God with all your heart involves that kind of activity. Right? Involves that. It's not just that I love Him because I think about, I think theologically. It's not because I've decided to keep his commandments. It's also the case that I put into his hands how I feel about life. And so whether I feel up, down, sideways, backwards, it doesn't matter. I give it to him and I say, Lord, okay, now you know how I feel. Do with it as you wish. So the ultimate goal of loving the Lord your God with all your heart is contentment. Right? What does Paul say? I've learned to be content. Ah, that means it didn't come miraculously. You didn't, I didn't pray, Lord, make me content. Oh, I feel so good now. Right? No, he had to learn it. In fact, he had to learn it by going through all the emotional steps of expressing how he feels, letting God understand him, giving it over to God, doing something about it. And then he says, over the course of time, I've learned to be, I've learned to be content. I've, I've learned that when I'm crushed, I'm not destroyed. I've learned that when things don't happen this way, I'm not, I don't give up on my joy. All that kind of stuff he had to learn. Okay? So, to love the Lord your God with all your heart involves all that. Then what says? All your heart, all your mind, right? Of course, in Greek, that's nous. So it makes perfect sense in Greek because we're rational thinking beings. But what's the word mind mean in Hebrew? If heart is my will, my emotions, my, my, my rational thinking, what is mind? Your intellect. I'm sorry? Your intellect. Your intellect? Intellect, yeah, well, I think that if we looked at that word hard enough, we'd come back to the nishma, the, the, um, the, uh, the expression that, set, that separates me from the animals, and that is my ability to communicate with the Creator, right? The nefesh haya that He breathes into me, that makes me who I am. In other words, to love Him with my mind is to love Him in my communication with Him is to love him according to the way that I, uh, that I interact with the world through speech, through thought, right? Okay? So all my mind, all my, all my heart, all my mind, all my, what's the next word? Strength. Soul. Soul, right? This is a really interesting word because in Hebrew there is no word for soul. Yeah? I mean, we have it in Greek, right? The word is psyche, suke in Greek for psychology, right? What is psychology? This, the, it, it doesn't turn out to be that way in the secular world, but the Greek word actually means the science, the study of the soul, right? 
we think it's a study of which drug you need in order to feel good. <laughs> but, the, but the truth of the matter is the Greek word is really soul study. So, unfortunately, Hebrew doesn't have a word for psyche. Why? Because in Hebrew, I'm not divided into body, mind, and soul parts. I'm one person. The word is nephesh. And I come as a person. The whole package at once. You're homogenized. You can't separate one thing from another. Right? So how you feel affects how you act. It affects how you think. How you think affects how you feel. People who are into holistic medicine know this. Right? Your emotions involve your physical well-being. Right? If you feel sad and depressed, you're going to get sick. Right? If you feel positive about life, the chances are that your immune system works better. Right? Did you think that holistic scientists invented that? No, God knew that a long time ago. So what happens is, when it says that, I, that I'm interested, that I'm supposed to love God with all my soul, and I realize that that means person, what does that involve? Now, this is really important. What does it involve to love God with all your person? In Hebrew, the idea of person is intimately connected with community. You are us. You are not an individual, an individual divided into parts, body, mind, and soul. To be a person is to be in community. So when it says, when, so when the commandment says, love God with all your heart, that's everything that makes up who you are, right? your mind, your intellect, your communication, and your soul, what it's really saying is, you need to love God in your relationships with the community. Because you are the community that you belong to. Right? You are a direct reflection of the genealogy that got you here, and the associations that you make when you're here. And we're going to see that in a minute. Okay? Love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and wetness. And what, what is wetness? Every resource that you have. Not just your monetary assets, not just your physical strength, that would be the Greek idea, but every resource that God puts into your path. Everything that you have, you love God through that. Okay? So you use your finances to further the kingdom, you use your relationships to further the kingdom, you use your influence to further the kingdom, you use every resource that God puts into your hands. Okay? So, notice what, what Yeshua says in response to the scribe. First he gives the scribe an answer that he already knows. He just gives him words in Hebrew that have much more meaning than we do, than we have. Right? We, we haven't thought through what, this all these, what do all these things mean. Now all of a sudden it's a bigger, much bigger picture. And then Yeshua does something really, really interesting. He says, and the, by the way, the scribe didn't ask for what two commandments are the great commandments. He asked for what is the greatest commandment. But he doesn't get a commandment. He gets two. Okay? And what, look what Yeshua says. And the, great, and the second is what? Is like unto it. Right? That's what the text says. What is that? What has he just said? He said that the second commandment is the equivalent of the first commandment. Right? Now this is really interesting. Because the second commandment comes from an obscure text in Leviticus that actually wasn't part of the culture, of the cultural thinking of the Shema. He picks this one little obscure text and he says, you know what? This commandment is the equivalent of this one. Okay? So that tells us something really important because what is the second commandment? Yes. Uh, equivalent, not equal. In, in the Afrikaans translation, that's translated as the second that is equally important as. Yes, it's equally important. Okay. okay? So here's what he's saying. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, mind, strength, soul, and strength. Whatness. Right? Everybody in the culture knew that because they said it three times a day. Right? Shema Israel Adonai Ohamana Adonai Had and they went right on into the commandment. Okay? Then he says something that they didn't know. There's another commandment that's equal to this one. Okay? Now this is really important because here's the point. How does anyone know that I'm loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? So, let me ask you. you are you loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? You hope so, right? How would I know? It's all interior to you, isn't it? It should show. It should show. It's completely inside of you. 
I can, you can say to me, yes, I'm loving the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And who am I to say, oh, no, you're not. Because it's your choice to do that. It's your choice to give those things over. It's your choice to release your emotions to him, to put your, his, your assets in his hand, to study his commandment and follow it, right? And I'm not the judge of what happens inside of you. So Yeshua says, there's another commandment. And that other commandment is equal to this one. In what way is it equal? That the manifestation of the second commandment shows me what's really happening inside of you. Right? And the second commandment is, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you realize what he just said? He said that I can look at your behavior with the people in your community. I can see how you treat your husband, your children, your neighbors, the friends that you have. And from that, I can decide whether or not you're loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. See, to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is not an observable behavior. And therefore, I can't tell whether or not that's actually happening in your life. But as soon as he says, the second commandment is like to it, now I can look at the way that you treat other people and see whether or not you're actually doing what you said. Right? See how important that is? That's why Yeshua says it's equal to it. He doesn't mean that loving your neighbor is the equivalent of loving God. He means that I can see whether you love God and how you treat other people. Right? Amen. So, given that, is it possible to be a follower of God on an island all by yourself? No, it's not because I have to have other people around me in order to measure my commitment to the first commandment, right? And the beautiful thing is, God puts you in the midst of lots of people, and, they, and, and they're not always easy to get along. <laughs> and as a result of that, you get, you get to test whether you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength by how you interact with others, right? So here's the point. Not only can you not identify yourself individually, but you can serve God individually. You must serve Him in the community. And you don't get to be the judge of whether or not you're doing it. Because it's the outside world that looks at you and says, hey, you say that you're a loving person, but look how you treated that person and look what you did over here. How can anybody who does this claim to be loving God? You see how that works? Okay. So you say, you know, Lord, I put all my finances into your hands. And then someone comes along who needs, who has a great need, compassionate need. And you say, I had a church say this, this to me one time. And the church committee said, I, let me give you the story. Um, my wife and I knew of a woman, a grandmother, who was caring for four children, two not, her, not of her own blood. Okay? And her husband was disabled. He died. That made her a widow. As far as I can tell, the Bible has very specific things to say about how you treat widows. Right? So I went to the church. She had a car accident and the car was destroyed. So Roseanne and I and a bunch of group of people got together and we bought her a car. And I went to the church and I said, this woman is part of your congregation. And these things have happened to her, all of which they were quite aware of. Right? And I said, I believe that you as a church should help participate in in the restoration of her livelihood because she can't go to work without a car. And you know what they said to me? It's not in my budget. <laughs> I don't care if it's not in your budget. You just expressed to me the fact that you're a church that has no compassion. And as a result of that, I look at the, at the commandment and say, that church doesn't worship God. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's severe, harsh words, but it's true. Because if you worship God, you're supposed to take care of the widows, orphans, and strangers among you. Right? And if you refuse to do that on the basis that you don't have the money, and by the way, you could build a five million dollar brand new church, right? But you couldn't buy a car for a widow. Don't tell me that kind of stuff. Because that tells me that you don't understand that how you treat others is a direct reflection of how you worship the Lord. Yeah. Right? Okay? Yeah. Alright, so we got that? So what does that tell us? That tells us that it, it that we cannot live without community. God puts us in community and he expects us to love him in the and express that love in the way that we treat other people around us. Okay? One doesn't come without the other. I know we wish that they did. We would be able, it would be really nice if we could just love God and get rid of all those people that are annoying me. 
<laughs> right? But it doesn't happen that way. Because God expects his love to demonstrate a change in your behavior that affects everyone around you. And he also actually includes the, uh, the possibility that I can look at how other people are treated by you and determine whether or not you're actually loving God. Right? Okay, so we got that. The Hebraic Greek view. Greek view, you can be Robinson Crusoe. Go live on the island, have a good life. But Hebrew view, not possible. There are no Robinson Crusoes in the Bible. Right? In the Hebrew view, you are tied to your community. You're tied intimately to your community so that the love of God in you must show up in the community. Okay. All right. So, so that helps us understand how the words in, scriptural, in the scripture actually are reflections of relationships, not reflections of identity. So let me help you with this word. This word is ish. It's the word that we translate man. It's used, I don't know, 2,400 times in scripture. Okay? If you go to any theological dictionary or lexicon, it's going to say ish, uh, translated man. Right? So you're going to find that all the way through scripture. Right? The problem is that it doesn't mean man. Because it doesn't mean man in the sense that we understand man. Okay? Um, and the, there's a rabbi who did a study on this. You can look it up on the internet if you want. Um, he looked at all the uses of the word ish in scripture and determined that between 85 and 90 percent of the time, it doesn't mean an individual male, independent of the community. What it means is the summary of all the relationships that make me who I am. Right? So ish in Hebrew, ish is a verb. In, in Greek, ish is a noun. What does that mean? That means in Greek, man is a person, place, or thing, a noun. In Hebrew, man is the summary of all the relationships, the interactions, the dynamics that make me who I am. So, tell me, tell me who you are. You know, it'd be difficult because you're in the shop, but we'll we'll deal with that in a minute. Okay? So, tell me who you are in relation in relationship. If you had to identify yourself according to your relationships, tell me what that identity looks like. Friend and husband. Oh, good. So first you're a friend. Yeah. Actually, it should be husband and then friend, just in case. <laughs> so, well, let's start with the proper order. First, who you are as a husband, right? And, and is this the other side? Yes. Okay. So what that means is this, that if you are first a husband, that's a relationship, and she goes away, are you still a man? Yes. No, not in Hebrew. Because Hebrew is the relationship. You don't exist independently of it. You're not a husband if she's not in the picture. And since relationships make you who you are, you can't be a man. Right? You're also, I've taken a father. Right? If you don't have children, can you be a father? I would say yes, you can. Yeah, how can you be a father and not have children? Oh, but that's not what father means. Doesn't father mean that you have children? Right? Ah, interesting. So now you're expanding it to include uh, the term so that you can not be the, the generator of actual people, but just the spiritual head of them. Right? But in Hebrew, that's not possible. In Hebrew, I'm not a father unless I have a child. Look at Abraham. Abraham could have said, oh, you're right, I'm going to be the father of many nations. It doesn't matter if I was born or not, because I'm the father of many nations. Wrong! Everything about Abraham's life is I have to have a son or I can't be a father, right? So you have to have a wife in order to be a husband. You have to have children in order to be a father. What do you have to have in order to be a friend? Another friend. Another, another person, <laughs> right? Okay. What do you have to have in order to be, uh, are you Australian or South African? Uh, the, the, the Zimbabwe. <laughs> Zimbabwe, okay. So in order for you to be a Zimbabwean, Okay? You have to have some relationship to Zimbabwe, right? You have to have been, been born there, you have to you know, immigrate there, whatever, right? And if I take away those things, then you're not a Zimbabwe, right? right? So there's another relationship. Give me another relationship. What do you do for work? Um, I'm a fitter. You're a, a fitter. I fit out the plant. A fitter? I never okay. knew that. Technician. What does that mean? Mechanical technician. Oh, a mechanical technician, okay? So if I take away the job, 
Are you an employee mechanical technician? No. The relationship makes you who you are. So now start thinking of yourself in terms of all the relationships. Think of yourself in terms of every relationship that you have. Because that's the summary of who you are in Hebrew. To be a man in Hebrew is to be the summary of all the relationships that make me who I am. And here's the difference. If I take those relationships away, I stop being who I am. My identity is tied to the relationships. One of the things that you didn't add, which you probably should have, is that you're a child of God. Right? But if you take away that relationship, it changes who you are, doesn't it? Every relationship that I have makes me more of who I am. Every relationship that I lose makes me less of who I am. And that means it's possible for me to not have the relationships that actually make that actually make me up. Right? So in Hebrew, ish is not a word about being a male, an independent, you know, two arms, two legs, tender. Right? That's that's Greek thinking. In Hebrew thinking, you are the sum of all of these other things. And you need them all in order to be who you are. Right? If I lose any one of them, I lose a piece of me. All right? So if that means that I exist, I exist in us, not in me. Right? Who I am is identified by the, all of the others in my life. All the relationships that I have. That's who I am. OK? Got it? All right. So that helps you with Greek thinking. Because what it tells you is all of those categories and classifications, employee, father, husband, friend, they have to be redefined in terms of their actions, not the status that you have. For example, you can be a fitter and not actually do any fitting, right? But not in Hebrew. If you're a fitter, you fit, right? If you're a fitter, you do mechanical technician stuff. If you don't do mechanical technician stuff, you're not a mechanical technician. It doesn't matter what it says on the, on the employment contract, right? When you go to the job, if they say to you, oh, I see that your title is mechanical technician, but we want you out there shoveling ditches. You're not a mechanical technician. You're a ditch digger, right? It's the relationship that makes you who you are, not the title, the status. So guess what? You're not a father because you have children. That's the opportunity for you to have a relationship that makes you a father. Right? You're not a husband just because you have a marriage license. You are a husband because of the way that you treat her. You are a father because of the way you treat your children. You're an employee because of the way you treat your employer. Right? You're, you're a believer because of the way you treat God. It doesn't come with an automatic title to it. That's the Greek idea. The Greek idea is I'm a husband because I have a marriage license. I'm a father because I created two children. I'm an employee because I work for a company. I'm a child of God because I said the sinner's prayer. It doesn't work that way in Hebrew. In Hebrew, if it's not an active, dynamic relationship, it isn't. It doesn't exist. Right, yes? Could you expand on that? Uh, I believe it. I believe it. You know, like you're not a... Yeah. What, what you just said was okay. quite so am I being a, child, a believer. Because am I a child of God because I... Because, because I'm, not, years I'm ago, not a big fan of the... Oh, no, I understand. Yeah. Am I a child of God because 25 years ago I walked down the aisle and said, Lord, I believe that you're the Son of God and you died for my sins. Mm. No. Is that a dynamic? Is that a, a verb relationship? Is that action? No. It is at that point, but if that's the last time I had interaction then I don't have that relationship anymore, right? Mm. The relationship exists in the action. So what does it, so now you understand why Yeshua says, if you love me, what do you do? Keep his commandments. You keep his commandments. Keep. Are the commandment, do I, do I pull out my, my you know, checklist from my back, back pocket and say, hmm, okay, so in 1997 I kept this commandment. 1998 I kept this one. Oh, that was great. And 2009 I actually kept these three, mm. right? Is that a relationship? No. no. Are, Keeping the commandments is, in a Hebrew, in Hebrew parlance, walking in the way that I walked. Okay? So now I can use you, so come on. <laughs> okay? So here's the difference. Okay? So you're gonna walk in the way that I walk. Okay? And, and the, by the way, the rabbinic expression is that you walk so close to the rabbi that the dust of his feet falls on your feet. Okay? That's what it means to walk. Okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to walk and you're going to walk behind me, right? Ready? Walk, 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 walk. Okay, now you stop right there. And I walk over here. Are you still following me? No, because no, 
you stop. Right? In order to follow me, just like this. If I'm going to follow you, take a step. Take another step. Take another step. Am I following you? No, I'm not. So when Yeshua says, if you love me, you keep my commandments, he means you're stepping where he steps. And for you to say, oh, I love you so much, but just go on down the trail. I'll catch up sometime. Mm. Right? That's not what he's talking about at all. Amen. Amen. Okay? The point is, I have to walk where he walks. And so every time he takes a step, I take a step. And if I decide not to step, I'm not in that relationship anymore, am I? If you decide to go to work, but today you decide, I don't think I'll be going doing any fitting today. I think I'll just sit in the office and fill out paperwork. What's your employer going to say? Hey, I hired you for a fitter. Where are, what are you doing? Oh, I'm watching the comics. On, I'm reading comics. I'm looking at the sports page. I'm here. I came to the job. Yeah, but you're not doing anything. Right? So God has the same idea. If, you, if you're one of his, you do his things. If you don't do his things, you're not one of his. Which is why Yeshua can say to those people who came, didn't we do this, didn't we do this, didn't we do this? He can say, no, I don't do you. Because you weren't doing it as I was walking. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Right. Okay, yes, Rudy. Just, um, so in, in that whole sort of historical way, did the idea of convents and monasteries, and how did they come up with that idea? What, what idea? Of isolating myself from... Not, um, you mean convents and monasteries and stuff like that? Isolating myself from the sin of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well actually, a whole bunch of the early church fathers actually it actually ran to the desert and lived as as hermits in order to get rid of the pollution of the world. Right? But that it's real interesting because God doesn't ask you to get rid of the pollution of the world. That's His job, not yours. What's your What's your job? Your job is to walk where he walks. Oh, so that means, let me see. Yeshua spent his time with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just make sure that when you're spending your time with the prostitutes, that people understand what you're doing. <laughs> okay? You see that? You see how our social culture actually, it, and he faces the same thing, doesn't he? Remember the prostitute who comes in to the meal and she starts weeping and she washed and she takes down her hair. Taking down her hair, by the way, was a, was a sign of sexual intimacy, which is why the rabbi gets or the Pharisee gets so upset. And then she dries his feet with her hair, right? Because she's she she can't help but express her emotions because they overwhelmed her as she's been removed from the guilt of her life, right? So she does she does that that and. What does the Pharisee say? Yeah, you can't let that kind of woman in here. Don't you know what she's like? And Yeshua's answer would be, of course. Of course I know what she's like. She's been forgiven. She's repentant. That's what she's like. He doesn't see what she did. She sees who he sees who she is. Right? So that that's interesting for us, isn't it? If we're walking as he walks, then I suppose we need to be involved with people who are really hurting and whose lives are broken. We need to be with them because nobody else will. I remember I went to, uh, I was in a Sunday school class once in, um, in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and in that Sunday school, it was an adult Sunday school class, I was visiting and listening to what they were talking about. And um, about half a mile away across the major intersection, there was a strip club. And the guy in the, in the Sunday school class said, oh, I'm so glad that we're not like those girls over there. They're in sin, and we need to pray for them that they'll come out of sin, they can join our Sunday school class, but we're, we would never have anything to do with them. And I said, how are they going to come out if you never have anything to do with them? Right? How are they going to understand if you don't ever interact with them? I'm sure you have the same ideas going on in the culture here. The idea is if I walk where he walks, I go where he goes. Right? And as I do that, the relationship continues, and I am one of his children. But as soon as I stop walking, you're on your own. Right? Okay? So, Ish tells me one more time that the Hebrew word for man doesn't mean me. It means all of the things that make me who I am because of the relationships with other people. Okay? So let's try another one. Yesha. Yesha is a word for woman. Right? Where did, uh, if you have been around me in the last couple of days, you can answer this question. Where's the first place that we find the word Yesha in Scripture? 
Genesis 2. Genesis 2, right? Why, why do I want to look for the first place? Because when I understand Hebrew words, I always want to look at the, the origin of the word. Because it helps me understand how the word gets used. Yes, question. Sir, what's the difference between Pesha Shah and Adam and Ah, that's a very good that's a very good question. So, at the beginning of the Genesis text, the word for man is Adam, right? Because there's a word play going on with the idea of Adama. What does Adama mean? Uh, ground. Yeah, dirt, dirt, ground, earth, right? Not, not Eretz, earth, but ground, okay? So why is there a word play between Adam and Adama? Because Adam comes from, the source of Adam is the earth, the dirt. God breathes into the dust, and it becomes a living being, man. Okay. By the way, it doesn't become a male. It becomes a living being, male and female. Okay. So now, there's the word play, Adam, Adam, Adam. But when I get to this verse, Genesis, it's actually Genesis 2.23, when I get to that verse, the first time ever, the word Ish and Ishar are introduced into Scripture. Okay. So here's the point. God doesn't call Adam Ish. Adam calls Adam Ish. God calls Adam Adam. Adam. Right? Adam introduces this word to identify who he is in relation to her. In other words, Ish is a relationship word, and so is Isha. You cannot have an Ish without an Isha. You cannot have an Asha without an Ish. In Hebrew, the two words are tied together. It's a word play, of course. Male, female. But notice what he says. She shall be called Isha because she comes from Ish. He doesn't say she shall be called Isha because she comes from Adam. He could have said that because he's Adam. But he recognizes that in her presence he's different. Right? And so the word Adam, which is his relationship to the earth, doesn't apply in this relationship. In this relationship, he exists because of her. Right? So in your relationship, you exist because of him. And by the way, he exists because of you. And so he says, I'm changing who I am because of you. Right? God, God sees me as Adam. I see myself as Ish because you exist. Right? Which means, in, in your marriage, that the reason he is a husband is because of you. And his identity is changed in your presence. If it weren't for you, he couldn't be that. Okay? So here's the, here's the example. The example is the first time Adam sees her, he recognizes that his whole life has changed, and he needs, he needs to be something else. Besides Adam, he must now be Ish. Okay? Why? Why does, why does that happen? Why, why does God even bring an Ish into the world? By the way, God makes the Ish from Adam, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay? So God takes Adam and makes an Ish, a Shah, and Adam, when he wakes up, recognizes that he's not the same anymore. Right? Okay, so why does that happen? What is the purpose of God even making an Isha? By the way, God doesn't make an Isha. He makes an Ezer Kenegdo. He calls the woman the Ezer Kenegdo. It's Adam who calls the woman Isha. There's a lot of interesting Hebrew stuff going on there. But the point, but my question is, still the same. Why does God even make this woman? It's not good for what does he say? No. It's not good for man to be alone. Oh, it's not good for man to be alone. Okay? So the reason that he makes the woman is so that Adam will have companionship, right? Okay. <laughs> the, no, he make, the reason that God makes the woman is so that Adam can have sex, right? Mm -hmm. No? No, because sex has nothing to do with it, and neither does companionship. Think about this. Does Adam have companionship before the Isha, before the woman is made? Yes. You're shaking your head, no. Yes, but the fact of the matter is he has perfect companionship. What does Adam do in the, key, in the cool of the evening? He walks with God. Now, I don't know about you, but would you rather have a, a perfect companionship with God or be married? <laughs> right? Good okay. question. <laughs> so, so obviously, obviously the issue of companionship has nothing to do with it's not good for man to be alone. Okay? 
It can't be about companionship. Oh, but it also can't be about exercising authority because he has authority over all the animals. It can't be about stewardship because he's already in the garden stewarding, doing stewardship things in the garden. Okay? So what must, the, must, must the question be, it's not good for a man to be alone, what must it be about? If it's not about companionship, it's not about authority, it's not about his tasks, what must it be about? Hmm? Community. Community, yeah. Well, first it is community, that would be companionship. It, but well, here's what, what does community mean? That Adam must learn to be in voluntary submission to another. I can't learn to be in voluntary submission if there's only me, right? Look, here's what I want you to do tomorrow. I want you to stand in front of the mirror and say, I submit to you. Right? <laughs> I submit to myself. Whatever myself wants to do, I'll do it. Right? That's not voluntary submission. Voluntary submission is there's somebody else out there who has a different agenda than me, and I learn to submit to her. Right? I can't submit to the man in the mirror. That's me. And that's the problem with Adam. When Adam's by himself, he has no one to submit to except himself, which means that he does whatever he wants. Right? He needs the other person, who, by the way, is a reflection of him, so that he can recognize she is exactly what I need in order to learn how to be in voluntary submission to another. And if I can't learn that, I can't do it with God either. So here's the best part. The best part is, he put her right where she's supposed to be so that you can learn to be in voluntary submission to her in order to understand what it means to be in voluntary submission to God. And it's so much easier to say, yes, Lord, I'm submitted to you, and not do what she says. Right? Isn't that easier? Because it's inside me. I can say, oh, I'm, I'm completely submitted to God. But by the way, this is what we're going to do in this household, and you're going to listen to me. Right? But that's not how God operates. God put her there so that you could learn to listen to her, and therefore you will have an open ear to him. All right, wasn't that nice? God didn't leave you in the garden all by yourself. He added someone to your equation so that you could practice with somebody who's right there in front of you. And that's what Adam says. Oh, this is perfect. She's the perfect person for me to practice community submission so that I can learn to listen to the, to the Father. Right? Perfect? Works, doesn't it? Right? So you've got to listen to her, because that's God's person in your life. Right? You put her there on purpose, so that you would have someone to listen to, so that you could understand what it means to listen to him. And if you don't listen to her, it's the equivalent of saying, I'm sorry, God, but I'll work this one out on my own. Right? Because he didn't design her to give you instructions from her agenda. He designed her to give you instructions from his agenda. She's just a mouthpiece. She's a vehicle by which God introduces his agenda into your life. Right? Right? So, he learns voluntary submission and he learns voluntary union. That means the objective of having someone that I learned to be voluntarily submitted to is so that the two of us can become one. That's what it's all about. Adam, God takes out of Adam something that Adam must have in order to be who he is. And then he says, work it out with her so that you can be one again. Right? He takes a piece of you, he puts it into somebody else, and he says, now you work it out so that all that comes back to you in voluntary submission. Not because you had it, but now you have to work at it and bring it back. Right? Perfect description of marriage. That's the way marriage works. Right? Every husband comes to his wife and says, I'm so glad God put you in my life because I need to learn how to be voluntarily submitted to you so that we can be one and enjoy the presence of the Father. Isn't that what husbands say? <laughs> no, you're laughing. But here's the guy who just said his identity is tied to you. If his identity is tied to you, then that means he must recognize you as God's gift to him so that he can serve the Father. Right? Which means he better be listening to what you're saying because what you need to tell him is what God wants him to know. Not what you want. You know, winter's... No, you guys aren't coming to winter. You're coming to summer, right? Summer. Summer's coming. I need a new wardrobe. Right? <laughs> that's, what you, that's your agenda. But his, the Father's agenda might be very different. The Father's agenda might be he's whispering in your ear, you know, I want, you to, I want the two of you to do this. And I'm counting on you to tell him so that he will listen to what you say as though God was speaking to him. Right? Works good, doesn't it? Works really good if it works. 
problem is we get our own agendas in the way. She starts thinking about a new wardrobe for the summer season, and you start thinking, how in the world can I turn my finances over to her? She'll spend it on whatever she wants, right? Okay, so notice that the very first relationship is exactly the, the foundation of how community works, right? How does community work? I submit myself to the community for, the, for their, for their well-being, my identity is tied to them. The more that I listen to them, the more I hear God's word. God tells me what to do in response to the community. I express his, I express his character in community, and we become one. Why do you suppose Yeshua says in his prayer that they may be one as we are one? Right? He's saying that the, the idea behind this whole thing is to bring unity. Why? Because God is a God of order, and when it's all about God, it's all about His unity. There's one God, Echad, He is one. And your objective in life is to get to one. Right? That's almost, that's an interesting oxymoron. Your objective in life is to get to one. Right? So the objective of your life is 21. To one, that's what you want to do. Right? What? Yeah, two equals one. Always, always, always. And in fact, it doesn't matter if it's married or not. Because community is also about becoming one. Isn't that what Paul says? Over and over and over. Look, why do you have all these dissensions? You're supposed to be in unity. You're supposed to be in harmony. Work toward harmony. Stop bickering over whether your kepa should be worn on the left side or the right side. Stop worrying about whether or not the talit is long enough hanging down from the you know, prayer shawl. Why do you care about that stuff? Can't you realize that you're here to become one? Right? Okay? So, there's a whole bunch more now. So, I am my community is the result of me understanding Ish Isha and expanding it to what all of God's trying to do. I am my community. Okay? Which means that if God is a verb, I am a verb. Now, why do I say God is a verb? What, what's God's name? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, kind of. We're not quite sure. It's yod he right? Yeah. In Hebrew, it's yod he But yod he is a form of the verb to be. It's not a noun. In other words, when we think of a noun, we think of person, place, and thing. And so we begin to think of God as a person with a name, a thing. Okay? But when God tells, when Moses says, what's your name, God? God gives him a verb. God gives him a verb, not a noun, okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to come with me. I'm going to be in Genoa, Italy, in March. And we're going to go to, uh, we're going to, go to the, the Basilica of the Annunciation, right? And we're going to go into the cupola. And we're going to look at the dome above. We're going to lay on the floor and look up at the dome. And you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a painting of a verb. No, you're not. You're going to see a representation of God as a noun. An old man with a beard and flowing robes and fingers that have electric sparks coming out. <coughs> right? In other words, in pagan thinking, in Greek thinking, God is a noun. But in Hebrew, God is a verb. So, here's your assignment. Go paint a verb. You can't paint a verb. A verb is, only exists in the action. As soon as the action stops, the verb isn't there. Okay? I want you to go paint the verb walking. Right? You can't do that because you're either walking or you're not walking. If you stop walking, you can't paint the verb walking because you're not walking. Right? So if you're going to be like God, you must be a verb, which means that if you're the community and God is the center of the community, he's a verb. So that means that you must become a verb. You think of yourself as a noun, a person. And you think of yourself as attributes. You have glasses. You have sort of long hair. You wear a gray shirt. That makes you who you are, but not in God's world. In God's world, you're a verb, which means you're identified by the things you do, right? So now, in order for me to say, who are you, you should be writing down a whole list of the things that you do. That's who you are. It doesn't make any difference how high you are, or what your weight is, it doesn't make any difference what your skin color is, who cares? Those are noun things. What I care about is what you do, right? That's why Yeshua can say, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's doing, right? So. Being human is to act as God acts. What does it mean to be a verb then? It means chesed. Right? 
Chesed, the most important word in the Hebrew scripture. And now it's time to take a break. Yeah, almost. Yeah, we can break. Almost picked up. Yeah, we'll just pick up. We'll we'll take a real. Can we take a real tiny short break? Everybody can stretch, stand up, get off these hard chairs. We'll come back and talk about chesed, and then we'll have to have some food, which is the children are already enjoying the verb of food. <laughs> All right. Okay. Can we do that? <laughs>